the guys that blew in those days, uh, great musicians, and, and they made great records, but they didn't get involved in the whole record. You know, they, they got involved in the music only, which is all right, you know. They, they uh, produced some great music. After that, they said, okay, Alfred, you got it. You, you got the liner notes. You got the, the, the photograph on the cover. You got the graphics. You got uh, the rest of it. You know, I, I, done my, I did my part, you know, so you got the rest of it. But I wasn't like that. I, I, I went to them and said, look, I would like to be involved in the whole project. You know, not just after the music. I, you know, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, sit down and talk with you. Who are we going to get to write these liner notes? Is it going to be Leonard Feather? Is it going to be somebody else, you know? Uh, uh, Who's going to do the graphics? Let me see them before you print them, you know, and let me check out, make sure everything's right. And what, let's pick the photos you're going to use, because I don't want to wind up seeing some photos that I don't like of myself on that album cover, you know. And so we worked hand in hand together with every phase of the, of the thing. Everything I know about making a record today, I learned from Alfred Lyons, you know, and he allowed me to learn from him, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. What people don't realize today is that the difference between 78s and LPs is cover art. You make a 78, you put it in a brown envelope, and boom, you have a record. Uh, once you come to the LP era, even the 10-inch LP era with three or four songs on a side, not only do you have more recording costs, but even if you're reissuing stuff that you already own, suddenly you have art costs. You have to create a front cover, write liner notes, create a back cover, and it became a far more expensive business to be in. The day that that guy walked in there, Blue Note changed. Uh, the one thing about working with Blue Note is that it gave him the freedom and the creativity that he was lacking in the advertising industry to, to be able to, to go in on the weekend into a lab and just play with, with type and, and do all these wonderful creative things that uh, what became the look of, of Blue Note Records. I like the fact that, uh, I know it's not supposed to matter that much, but the records always looked so good. Sometimes I just look at the covers. I pull out my Blue Note stuff and I just look at the covers just to get a vibe. I don't even have to listen to the records. This is a classic cover. It's time, Jack and McLean. And the music inside is really reflective. And when you put it on, you feel the urgency. You feel the, the movement of the record itself. And when you look at the cover, it just seems to work so well. Great. He played with the words, he played, um, he'd take Frank's pictures and crop through the head, which Frank absolutely hated, um, you know, and did some wonderful things with those, you know, with those pictures. And they used to have terrible fights about it, screaming fights, but Reed was screaming and Frank was screaming and Alfred was screaming, but they got the cover through. They got the cover through that the three of them wanted. They, they, it was always a compromise because maybe Reed was just so terribly daring for his time. Freddie Roach did a record. Here's one called Mo Greens, Please, which is an expression that he would say to somebody and say, hey, give me some more greens, you know, give me some more food. So here he is in front of the uh, place in, I think, in New Jersey where he enjoys eating food, asking the woman to give him some more greens. Tony Williams Sprint, which says it's just a simple orange on white, but it's a beautiful, simple concept. And on the back, very little information, but in, it's sort of like a minimalist, it's almost haiku. And he had pretty well developed this, this entire look and changed the way that uh, jazz albums in particular were viewed. I mean, the, the graphics and everything else, and they're way beyond anything that was happening at the time. I mean, here's a great one. The three sounds, it's just got to be. <laughs> three. Those early covers, they've been copied all over the world. Caddy for Daddy. The funny part is that, that he wasn't really into jazz. He would take all, of the, all the album covers that they would give him and he'd go down to the uh, music store and trade them for classical records. <laughs> 